Hey everybody, this is your daily dose of all things royal. Welcome back, my gorgeous, good-looking friends. It's another day down the rabbit hole and was supposed to have a video out yesterday. However, I discovered on a couple of things and today I've been working on it and I highly suggest you stick it out to the very end. You don't want to miss what has been uncovered. So let me just get into this video. Here's what I think. I think Harry's in a bit of trouble and Meghan has hung him out to dry. Now, I can't say that Meghan is solely responsible for all of this, but she was a major, if not the main driver for where we are today and what we're witnessing. We are at a point where we don't need to rely on the media because, let's be honest, they are not doing their job. The unfortunate thing about this court case is it was not televised for the public to actually see firsthand what was being said and the reactions. We had to rely on the journalists. And once again, the journalists who side with Meghan and Harry, like a Jack Royston, do not report facts and push his propaganda. Harry is not winning the public court of opinion because so many lies have been exposed. And the more they keep talking, the more everything starts to unravel. And I think that this was the biggest mistake Harry has made thus far, because he has just now opened up a huge can of worms. Now, I'm not too familiar with the court cases in the UK when it pertains to these types of lawsuits. It's not like it's a criminal case, so not really sure, you know, what the consequences are for lying. But you see, Megan had set a precedence because she showed the world that you can lie and say that you misremembered. Omid Scobie lied in the court case supporting Megan and nothing happened to him. And Omid Scobie lied again in this court case when he gave his testimony a couple weeks back. Why is his statement even being allowed? What I don't understand is why is nobody making a big deal about it? Take, for instance, with Harry. He said that he was taking legal action to stop hate towards Meghan and lied on the stand when he said that his first thought about taking legal steps was when he was on holiday in France in 2018 when he met David Sherborne who is now his lawyer. That's 100% a lie. And stupid Harry goes and reinforces it by saying that it was mentioned in his book. Did he not think that there are people out there like me who will go and cross-reference to this book? So in spare, he writes, Meg and I were on the phone with Elton John and his husband, David, and we confessed we need help. We're sort of losing it here, guys. Come to us, Elton says by which he meant their home in France. Summer 2019. Let me read that again. Summer 2019. So in this chapter, they take a break, and then they go into talking about the beginning of their tour in South Africa, which was September 2019. But then they cut back, referring back to this little vacation, and state, it was partially down to Elton and David. At the end of our recent visit, they'd introduced us to a barrister, an acquaintance of theirs, a lovely fellow who knew more about the phone hacking scandal than anyone I'd ever met. He'd share with me his expertise, plus loads of open court evidence. And when I told him I wish there was something I could do with it, when I complained that we had been blocked at every turn by the palace, he offered a breathtakingly elegant workaround. Sure, Megan. I'm sure there's going to be many people out there saying, well, maybe he meant 2019. And banking on the substantial truth doctrine, like how Megan is doing so with Samantha's court case. So I want to throw that idea out the window and dig further to show you that this too was also a lie. So we go back to this article that Megan's five friends contributed to which we all know what the intention was for Megan to allow such an article. She was trying to do brand image control by painting herself as this really loving and caring daughter, as well as great humanitarian and friend. 
Well, that ticked off her father because of the nasty letter that she wrote to him. And what he did was give the Daily Mail a redacted copy of this letter. Now, he redacted certain lines in it because they were so malicious and hurtful that he didn't want to embarrass his daughter further, but he did want to defend himself because the article made him look like a shitty person. At least that's how he felt, because the way that she was treating him totally contradicted what her friends were painting her and saying about her. So this PR attempt to rebrand Megan as the kind, compassionate friend and daughter blew up in her face. Now, keep in mind, when Harry talks about all the attacks that Megan was facing, it wasn't attacks. The truth was coming out about how she was bullying staff, how she made Kate cry, how she bullied Charlotte. All her nastiness was coming out. And Megan and Harry were pissed off that the palace would not lie for them and cover it up. This is what's really the underpin of all of this was their bad behavior. So now what we're seeing is karma coming right back around and biting them in the ass. And Meghan Markle, being the coward that she is, has made Harry go out to fight her battles and also at the same time clean up the mess that she has been making. And there is no doubt in my mind that when this letter was released to the Daily Mail, she immediately thought to sue. It wasn't like they sat back and talked to the palace to ask them if they could sue. Maybe they went to them to say, hey, can you put out a statement? And that was to the extent of the discussions. And when they said no, that was it. They went off and did their own thing. They didn't ask for any permission. So what Harry said in spare... I don't buy it. And then when you look at Finding Freedom, that's the book that keeps on giving. This book, if you think about it, it was really the first rebranding and attempt to clean up all the things that had been said and leaked by many people out there of this couple's bad behavior. The book makes it a point to talk about this bad press that they were receiving and justifying the reasons why they decided to take legal action on her father or the Daily Mail. They give themselves away in contradicting what Harry had said on the stand as well as what was said in the book Spare. And right at the beginning here, it says, up to now, we have been unable to correct the continual misrepresentations, something that these select media outlets have been aware of and have therefore exploited on a daily and sometimes hourly basis. Now, this line is important. It is for this reason we are taking legal action, a process that has been many months in the making. So in Harry's testimony, he said that he bumped into David Sherborne in 2018 in France. Well, in 2018, Harry didn't go to France, but he did go to France in 2019, and the month was August. Here's the thing. If this process had been many months in the making, it would be impossible for him to just meet David Sherborne at the end of August and then turn around to file a lawsuit And Megan filed a lawsuit that was so comprehensive. And we know that it's comprehensive because continuing on in Finding Freedom, it says the attached lawsuit brought by Megan was for invasion of privacy, breach of data protection and copyright infringement claims against the Mail on Sunday for printing extracts from the private letter she wrote to her father in August 2018. And now here's the interesting thing. Although Harry didn't announce them with the news of Meghan's lawsuit, he had also filed lawsuits at the same time against The Sun and The Mirror regarding their alleged illegal interception of his voicemail messages between 2001 and 2005. Harry and Meghan wanted to keep their legal proceedings separate and away from prying eyes within Buckingham Palace, where they had been advised not to take legal action. So they enlisted Clinton solicitors for him and Schillings, the UK's leading law firm in defamation and media-related cases for her. The Duchess's lawyers, who included David Sherborne, who once represented Princess Diana, 
were prepared setting out an extensive list of false and absurd stories to highlight a pattern of mistruths. So many months in the making, quite extensive and detailed. So obviously, between the end of August to the end of almost September, in a month's time to put this together, no. Harry saying that he bumped into David Sherborne for the first time and didn't know anything about it? Uh Uh-uh. So now this section becomes suspect because why did they make it a point to state that Harry didn't want to announce that he filed against the sun and the mirror because it was at the same time that Meghan had filed her lawsuit? And then to go out of your way to deflect by letting Meghan announce her lawsuit and directing attention over there, it leads me to believe that Harry had this in the works. He didn't want for anybody to know about it and it go through the process in the hopes, and this is my own personal opinion, the company would end up settling, like what happened with his brother, quietly. When you look at the filing, Harry filed two days before Megan. Not sure if they were trying to time it to be filed at exactly the same time. To me, this looks like they were being sneaky and shady. And then mentioning in the book that you hired two separate law firms because you didn't want the palace to know. To me, that sounds like they were going behind the palace's back. Harry totally knew who David Sherborne was, or at least knew of him, because his mother had hired him and she won about 1.5 million pounds against the same newspaper, The Mirror Group, for publishing photos of her in her working out clothes. So I highly doubt that Harry didn't know who David Sherborne was. And you know what? The fact that he made it so obvious to give such a lame excuse, especially when it's detailed in both the books that he contributed to. There is definitely more to this story that we are not privy to just yet. So giving Harry the benefit of the doubt, even if he didn't know of him when his mother was alive, he definitely knew who he was later on when the Levinson inquiry came out. David Sherborne is a super well-known barrister who has been pretty much the face of helping the victims in the Levinson inquiry. And his clients, pretty famous people like Sienna Miller, Jude Law, Sarah Payne, Hugh Grant, Elton John. Apparently, he's the show guy to represent these clients that are fighting. Now, as an American, I didn't understand the difference between the role of a solicitor and the role of a barrister. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the solicitor is really the one that does the work outside of the court. And, you know, they'll be there possibly to assist inside the court. But the barrister is the one that represents the clients in court and often are the face. And they do have specialty in their field. And that would make sense because he's attached to all these cases involving litigation against the Rupert Murdoch press companies. And when you look at this document here, I'm like looking at it and it almost is like it's a master agreement that blankets this litigation against the Mirror Groups. It says it here in the first paragraph, the Mirror Newspaper's hacking litigation, which has been running since 2011, is in its fourth phase and more than 80 individual claims are currently progressing towards a third trial within this phase, scheduled to start in about May 2023. That would be what we're seeing here, correct? And from what I gather, what has been going on is that a lot of these clients that are in litigation tend to settle out of court where Rupert Murdoch's company ends up paying an ungodly amount of money to these victims. Rupert Murdoch has been shelling out the nose in like over a billion dollars so far in these claims. And let's not forget, here in the United States, They lost their battle with Dominion and ended up having to pay like $787 million. So this guy is bleeding money with all these claims. And I almost wonder if Prince Harry was roped into this because it almost feels like it's a legal smash and grab. And Meghan probably thought it was a great idea because she saw dollar signs. Quick and easy, 
get them to summary judgment or get them to settle out of court. And because of who you are, they're not going to say no and they're going to give us what we want attitude. And I think Harry was sold a story and a scam that is now playing out on a global stage. So Brian Cathcart is an Irish-born journalist, and he is a founder of the Hacked Off organization, which seems to be hell-bent on taking down Rupert Murdoch. He's also very much in favor of censoring the media and putting regulation around it. Hugh Grant, who's also listed in one of the claims going after one of these newspaper tabloids is a board of director on the Hacked Off or is an executive director for this organization. Enter in this guy, Graham Johnson, who back in the day had sort of flipped to the other side in blowing the whistle on alleged hacking of celebrities at the Sunday Mirror, the same newspaper that Harry is currently suing. Now, it appears like this guy struck some type of plea bargain in which he only got like two months in jail for, I want to say, giving information on how these journalists would be hacking the phones of these celebrities and possibly gave names of other people and threw them under the bus in order to save himself. So he gets out after two months and rebrands himself as if he's reformed exposing corruption in the media. Hence, he starts writing articles for a division of Byline, which was started by Peter Jukes, writing articles in the division called Byline Investigates, which is strictly focused on these various tabloid newspapers, the Mail, the Mirror, and anything that Mr. Murdoch is touching. Seriously, this website is like a targeted hate campaign on steroids against Rupert Murdoch. Now, if you look through it, what you'll notice is that all the evidence that, or for the most part, the evidence that Harry talked about in his testimony actually are featured in articles majorly written by Graham Johnson. What we learn is that the BBC ends up hiring Graham Johnson to be a consultant. He's not actually allowed to speak on camera per the rules. So they hired and paid him as a consultant. And it appears like that was all on the down low. Meanwhile, Graham Johnson connects with Gavin Burroughs and sweet talks him into helping out with this documentary. We'll get to Gavin Burroughs in a second. But in the background, Graham Johnson is negotiating these deals. And also you have... Brian Cathcart getting involved in writing articles for Byline Investigates. Now, remember, he is the founder of the organization Hacked Off with Hugh Grant. Coincidentally, Brian Cathcart has gone into business with Graham Johnson. What's up with that? So anyhow, Graham Johnson is on this crusade in truth-telling and is running this website, which is claiming to be committed to exposing wrongdoing and organized crime in this space. Part of his tactic would be hiring these private investigators or buying information from these investigators to use as evidence in these cases. And two of those private investigators that have come into focus recently are Christine Hart and Gavin Burroughs. They have been roped into the orbit of Prince Harry's court cases with Associated News and the Mirror Group. Now, not sure if many of you had paid attention, but back in March when Harry showed up, surprise to everybody, we start learning like right before this court case begins that somebody had forged Gavin Burroughs name on a witness statement. In addition, we have Christine Hart coming out talking about how Graham Johnson did her dirty and walked away with not giving her the money that he had promised her for these invoices or so-called evidence that was going to be used in these court cases. At the same time, Gavin Burroughs and Graham Johnson had a falling out, and it appears like somebody had forged Gavin Burroughs' signature on this witness statement that was going towards Prince Harry's court case. So this is blown up in the sense that Graham Johnson testifies for Prince Harry as of last week, 
And now his credibility has been pulled into question and is being called out on social media by Gavin Burroughs and Christine Hart. He's essentially accusing the legal team for doctoring statements. There's also claims that even the evidence, aka these invoices that Graham Johnson was purchasing from these PIs, had been doctored to sway the court. What I find crazy is that all of this is coming out and nobody's reporting on it or talking about it. So what happens to Gavin Burroughs' Ford signature? Obviously, the legal team had to have known where that document came from. Is there going to be no inquiry into that? Or are they just going to sweep it under the rug and pretend that nobody paid attention? And now it makes total sense as to how Harry came back and said he doesn't remember or he saw these invoices. Perhaps, maybe, the legal team, along with Graham Johnson and crew, showed Harry a whole bunch of statements in which he believed were true. Christine Hart's name is actually on one of them, which I believe she is protesting against. Harry's accusing Christine Hart of unlawful activity, which I believe she is denying. Do I think Harry knew to some degree that he was being conned? Mm, yes and no. I think he might have had a suspicion and was doing a lot of this in the name of Megan and defending her privacy. I think to some degree he did. I think in the beginning he was sold on evidence that may, may have been fabricated. And these articles that were written in Byline, they're actually quite convincing. So he probably read a whole bunch of them and was like, yeah, sign me up. As to how the conversations began, we don't know because their responses in the testimony in the various books are all different. So it's probably safe to say that that true story has yet to come out. I do believe that he probably had been thinking about this since 2018 when he met this woman and she started to complain left and right about how her privacy was invaded and that these stories that were coming out, even though they might have been true, she was lying to Harry and getting him to believe everything that she was saying and started to think about taking this kind of action in order to defend her. She's definitely the source for all this litigation. Which brings me to revisiting this case that the Harkles filed back in July of 2020. Apparently, they got wind that X-17, it's almost a low-grade TMZ, had been shopping photos of Archie, claiming that he was caught, papped, in Malibu. Let me read the first couple paragraphs so you understand what this case is about. So it says, Plaintiffs Prince Harry, the Duke of Sussex, and Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, are the parents of Archie, who is 14 months old. At the beginning of this year, the plaintiffs announced their intention to reside at least part-time in North America in an attempt to escape the incessant UK tabloid attention. Their first stop was North Saanich, Canada. Their peaceful stay lasted until a British tabloid published their exact location. After dozens of paparazzi and media organizations descended on the quiet, isolated town from hundreds of miles away, the plaintiffs moved to a gated community in the greater Los Angeles area. Here, too, they lived peacefully for six weeks. Until, once again, because Megan's so famous and so special... Their exact location was published. Within hours, paparazzi set up hundreds of yards away up on the ridgetop overlooking the residence, hoping to capture photographs of the family. Despite the large mesh fence they had erected to guard against telephoto lenses, the plaintiffs have been unable to shield themselves from the paparazzi. Some have flown drones a mere 20 feet above the house as often as three times a day. Others have flown helicopters above the backyard of the residence as early as 5.30 a.m. and as late as 7 p.m. day after day. 
And still, others have even cut holes in the security fence itself to peer through it. The family did their best to ignore these physical and constructive trespasses until they learn that someone is shopping photographs of Archie to tabloids in the United States and the United Kingdom. The unscrupulous actor shopping these photos claimed to have taken them on a recent public outing in Malibu. But Archie has not been in public. Right, because he's a hostage. Let alone the Malibu, since the family arrived here. Rather, it is clear that photographs were taken of activities in the private yard of the residents unbeknownst to the plaintiffs. This is not an innocent mistake, but an intentional attempt to evade liability under California law for obtaining unsolicited photographs of a young child in the privacy of his own backyard, most likely by drone or telephoto lens. So as I was going through this document, I started to notice a couple things that struck me as a little odd. So in this paragraph, when they first initiated this lawsuit that was filed on July 23rd, 2020, it says the true identities of John Doe's 1 and 2 are currently unknown. However, prior to instituting this action, the plaintiff's representatives issued requests to several photographic agencies, including Backgrid and Splash, for Archie's information. So they went to these two places that Megan has on speed dial and asked for this information, kind of like what they did in New York. And what they're saying here, under the European Union's general data protection regulation, Neither agency responded. So already this is bizarre because they don't know who John Doe 1 and 2 are, but they file a lawsuit. They've gone to Backward and Splash and they didn't respond. However, there was a rumor that there were photos being shopped around of Archie. And then on J July 6th, it's saying here that they had posted on their website that they were selling 26 images of Archie and Doria. Then if you see a bullet number four, it does go into a little bit more detail to say that Megan had contacted Splash, Backrid, USA, and Coleman Rayner and asked them to provide Archie's information, including the photographs at issue, pursuant to the GDPR regulation. Coleman Rayner responded that they were not in possession of or shopping the images. Neither Splash nor Backrid responded. So out of curiosity as to why would Coleman Rayner and Backrid have to give photos over in compliance to GDPR regulation if they were taken in California? And those are two California companies headquartered here in the United States. Only Splash would be... I want to say responsible for the GDPR rules because they're headquartered in London. And then number five is pure manipulation. So BuzzFeed reports the existence of 26 images of Archie and his maternal grandmother dated July 6 that were made available for sale. And then they list the, the website. But this case was filed on July 23rd and Ellie Hall was the one who reported on it the very next day, just regurgitating what the original filing had said, which is exactly what I just read to you. So now we have this case that's making it look like, yes, X17 was advertising this on their website. Nobody's seen the pictures, by the way. Megan's lawyers in this document expressed a real sense of urgency in getting these photos back. Now, I can understand that you don't want photos of your child being put out there. That obviously makes total sense. But when you look at the context of why they were asking for it, then you scratch your head and say, wow. And what I mean by that is that they were in a hustle, not because they truly wanted to protect Archie's privacy, but for other reasons that obviously are selfish. So as I read through this document, there are three exhibits. Exhibit A is tied to X17, which is the low-grade TMZ. Then there's exhibits B and C. B is tied to requests to splash. And then C is tied to backgrid. 
So when I look at the request for Exhibit A, it says here, request for production number one, all documents constituting or reflecting sale or license agreements between you and the photographers of the 26 photographs of Archie Harrison Mountbatten Windsor dated on or about July 6, 2020, that have ever been offered for sale on your website. So this is the X17 low-grade TMZ. They ask for request for production number two, all communications between you and the photographers of all photographs of Archie Harrison Mountbatten Windsor taken on or after March 15, 2020, including but not limited to those referenced in request for production number one related to those photographs. And then for request for production number three, all photographs of Archie taken on or after March 15, 2020, including but not limited to those referenced in request for production number one in their native digital format with metadata intact. So I'm looking at this and saying, is this a typo? It says March 15, 2020. I thought maybe this was an error and they made a mistake. So I continue on and the same exact requests are for Splash and Backgrid with the exception of March 15th plastered on all three of the requests. And I said to myself, that doesn't make any sense because at that time, Megan and Harry were living in Canada and they were finishing off their last engagement in the Netflix mockumentary. It was around March 12th when he was flying back to Canada then to discover that they had been papped. So why were they asking for these companies to turn over anything beginning as of March 15th when they weren't even in L.A. at that time? This document even emphasizes that they were in the U.S. for a good six weeks without being noticed until the paparazzi found them. So why are they asking for any photos that begin after March 15th? Inquiring minds want to know. And I kid you not that today when I was looking through the database on Harry's lawsuits and looking at the files to see who the law firms were in the database, my eyes glanced over Megan's court cases, but I didn't look too deep into them because I thought they were tied to the Daily Mail and that stupid letter that she was suing over. As I was skimming the database, which is public, by the way, I just glossed over Megan's court case. And sometimes I have this knack for just keeping a snapshot in my head. I pull out these random moments. And this is one of those random moments where I actually remembered that I saw the word splash. So after I read that in the legal document, I said, let me go back to this database and check this out further. Let me go back to this database and check this out further. So now I'm looking at this and I notice the date. And they filed this on March 25th, 2020. So now this makes a whole lot of sense. I can't say that I'm surprised, but they even lied about this too. Those photos, they were taken in March of 2020. And Megan was desperate to squash the story because she had everybody believing that they were in Canada. Remember. Archie did not go to the UK for their final engagement, and it was Doria that was watching him. Doria was in LA with Archie, probably went outside in Tyler Perry's palatial gardens. What I think happened was Megan got wind. Megan got wind of this somehow, maybe found out that Splash had been trying to get photos in California and had her lawyers immediately slap down a cease and desist. So fast forward a couple months later, I guarantee that Backgrid was trying to broker this and maybe sell it to TMZ and TMZ wouldn't touch it. So they went to X17 and this is how this all unraveled. But what this is telling us here that Megan and Harry were desperate to make sure that they got the names of 
the two people who took the photo so they can seize everything. And that's why the lawyers was so aggressive in getting this discovery order put in place and then shut this down quickly. Because why would they have filed about this back in March if this really happened in July? You know what I'm saying? So yeah, they lied to the public and they did their very best to keep it contained until now. And this right now does mess up the press discovery intrusion story in Canada. This does mess up having to flee to Los Angeles on the Freedom Flight before the borders closed in March 2020. And this jeopardized all their stories for Oprah, Netflix, Spare, and now these court cases. So Harry has been fully in it from the very beginning, and he went along with this plan. I think in the very beginning, he was so besotted with Meghan that he would lie, cheat, steal for her. And that's kind of exactly what he's done. Seriously, all for what? To try and make her happy? Which, who is she? She's a nobody. Look what she's done to so many people. And now she has completely destroyed anything good that Harry had in his life. And now he's left as a broken man. This is what we're seeing in front of us. Gavin Burroughs was a big supporter of Meghan and Harry. And I'm, I'm sure he still supports them, but he, he is calling out what he's seeing. And he says, I really do feel sorry for Harry. You can see he is hurting whilst being totally ripped off by his legal team who don't even check facts. Megan refused to support him, promote his book Spare. She was busy in L.A. with film execs. Also refused to back his current court case, and he permanently rents a hotel floor with Jim Near family home. Allegedly, only daytime visits to see children. He needs time out, and it appears she is done with him? Poor sod. But stop lying and sack your proven corrupt legal team. Here's the thing. Harry is surrounded by vultures, including his bitch wife. And what they have done, every one of them, in L.A., in this court case, they've taken advantage of him and exploited him. And yeah, in that respect, I do feel sorry for him because he truly didn't understand what the real world was like, understanding of what greed felt like, because he never had to worry about not having. And once Megan ripped him from the only thing that he knew, essentially, she then made him constantly obsess over money, because she's a greedy little clout-chasing goblin who has really messed with this man's mind I'm not going to say that he was completely innocent from Jump Street, but she sure didn't help him be a better person. In fact, she has been slowly pushing him over the edge. And I wouldn't doubt for one second she's trying to figure out how to get out of this situation with a maximum payout. So I can honestly see her continuing to set him up and hanging him out to dry like in this situation, so when she gets ready to leave him, or if he does decide to unalive himself, which I could see that happening, and Doria and Megan being there right by his side to provide whatever he needs to make it look like, quote unquote, an accident. And that's my opinion. I'm going to end this video now because I'm exhausted. This was a pretty intense research exercise. I just want to say before I leave, yeah, for all those wondering about Dorito, yeah, there are traces of a record out there. For those who like to sleuth, I'll give you a clue. April 30th, 2016. Happy hunting. It's all out there. And on that note, I will be back with more content, but until then, please be safe, and I'll talk to you later. Bye! Oh, yeah. such a broad! <laughs>